hello everyone and welcome to another episode of our knowledge based podcast series uh, this time we have with us mr ankit kanodia uh, ankit sir is the founder of smart sync services which is a fundamental driven education and advisory services uh, welcome ankit sir thank you ankush thank you for having me here uh given the kind of rich experience ankit sir has in terms of educating thousands of uh, investors and advising them i think the key goal or outcome of this podcast has to be uh, understanding some of the key mistakes and challenges faced by retail investors and how we can address them uh before beginning uh just a standard disclaimer so search capital is a trade name brand name by, used by me ankush agarwal i'm a sebi registered individual research analyst uh nothing that we discuss in this podcast uh, should be considered as a recommendation kindly read all the disclosures in the description below uh ankit ji uh, can you share your disclosure from your part as well sure thank you ankush uh, uh hello everyone i am ankit kanodia uh, i am a founder of a sebi registered investment advisory firm smart sync investment advisory services we are a sebi registered investment advisory firm based out of ahmedabad and whatever we discuss uh, will be uh, just to educate people uh, don't take anything as a recommendation to buy or sell so okay so angit let's start from the beginning like can you talk a bit about how you started into markets into investing how the journey has been what led to start of smart sync services and how that has evolved over the years sure so uh, i'll go back uh sometime in 2008 9 uh so i so i did my bcom from sanjeevs kolkata uh okay. and i was a commerce student and uh, just like any commerce student at that time in sanjeevs uh, i enrolled myself for ca so but i was not enjoying even though i understood accounts taxation costing and everything but i didn't enjoy the whole process of being an accountant or an auditor i even did article chief in a very good firm based out of kolkata but i was not enjoying the process and i didn't know what i want but i know that i knew that i don't want this so that led me to explore uh, mba so i did my mba uh, in exam mb uh, from 2007 to 9 so that two years uh, was a very 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 good opportunity for me to explore and that is where i kind of had uh, a liking for uh, deep research for the markets so okay. even then i didn't identify myself as an investor but more as a research analyst so i wanted to go into research but i graduated in at the height of recession uh, right. in a college there were hardly any placement opportunities but now when i look back that was a blessing in disguise because i immediately got a got an opportunity in a stock broking firm in kolkata they were starting a research division i'm talking about 2009 end sometime so i joined them uh, as one of the most junior uh, member in the team i worked there for one year but then uh, i had this feeling that i wanted to do uh, on my own so i want to learn on my own i want to read books i want to reach out to different investors and then chart my own journey rather than working in a company i don't know what was the there was no clear logic is just that it was a hunch that i want to do on my so i i knew that if i tell this to my parents they will probably find it very uh, risky so yeah. i first quit i gave my resignation and then i told my dad that i am not going to work so that there is no chance of going back so my dad being a traditional marwadi businessman who has never seen stock market early uh, ever in his life and for him stock market is just like gamble like many other yeah. people yeah. in the country so for him that that was a big gamble so he told that okay you want to do investing you want to learn about investing that's fine but uh, i don't understand investing at all so you i'm giving you some money start a business go to gujarat and side by side you do whatever you want to do so i was not happy but uh, i didn't have any other option so in 2011 i moved to gujarat uh, in kutch there is a small town called gandhidam that is where i started a new business under a guidance of one of my uh, uncle and uh, coincidentally while i was struggling and setting up that business 
I was also reading voraciously. I was reading all the Warren Buffett letters. So yeah. I could see a lot of parallels between uh, his textile business and my timber business. So okay. I could see that I can't see myself 10 years down the line running this business. So I was spending more time learning about markets than uh, figuring out how to improve my business. So what I did uh, in the first two, three years, I'm talking about 2013 or 14, I called my mom, dad to Gujarat from West Bengal. And then I told my dad that this is, this is something which I can't do. This business I can't do 10 years down the line. And you being a businessman yourself all your life, it's better that you take care. I'll hand over to you once you are ready. But uh, I don't want to do it. So that is when I was very clear that that was the time when I knew that I have to do something in markets. So then I kept on exploring. Uh, Safal Nivesak was a very instrumental uh, platform for me because I used to be very active there. I used to participate in a lot of competition and luckily won a few though. It gave me some confidence that maybe I'm on the right path. And Vishal was very helpful. Through Vishal, I met Anshul Kare. I don't know if you know him or not, but he has been a good friend also. Uh, and through them, I met many other friends in the industry. And that gave me some confidence that I should start. 2016 is when I started SmartSync Services. And 17 is when we took the SEBI license. Okay. So that's pretty much my story about how I started. Right. Okay, so smart saying started with the education part first or the no the recommendation so, part. So 2017 when we started, it was more of a uh, at that time we had no presence on social media, we had no idea about how to make content and all. Our main focus was managing, uh, as in managing okay. in the sense advising people on their. Uh, people. But yeah. in 2020, uh, when COVID hit, uh, we had a very bad time. Uh, we some of our uh, customers also went away because of the COVID uncertainty, because of the portfolios going down. I'll not, I'll be honest here. So uh, then we had to rethink about our business model. And that is where we started thinking about education, content. And from there onwards, our business model kept on changing and evolving as we went. Uh, so Ankit sir, this thing is what, what I wanted to ask is, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, there has been substantial increase uh, in interest of retail investors looking to learn equity research, or at least to understand that, right? Uh, substantially post post COVID, uh, like pre COVID, uh, if I could recall, hardly other than Sapal Nivesha and Doctor Vijay Malik who was there, who were doing something like this. Like I learned my entire based on how to research based on what the writings of Doctor Vijay Malik himself. But over the last couple of years. There has been substantial increase, uh, despite the fact that this is not the first bull market that India has seen, right? We had had bull markets in the past as well, but that time there was no such uh, increase in trying to learn. Everybody was going about, say, going after research services, but anyone trying to uh, learn and educate themselves on how to do research was not there. So what, according to you, has changed over the last couple of years that is leading to such uh, heightened interest in people trying to learn also? Yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, I, I thought a lot about it uh, in the past few years also. And my view is that probably COVID had a big role to play here. So when COVID hit, we were all stuck at our home. We couldn't go out, right? And so all of us in the country had a lot of time. Plus, I'm talking about a time when UPI was active. You can yeah. easily sign up on any uh, small course, say 100, rupees, yeah. 500 rupee course and attended and coupled with all these uh, new age uh, brokers who were very active on social media. And then thanks to people like SOIC, Hmoit, who is a very good friend again, he also, I think, started at that time. So right. the confluence of all these factors led to a lot of people who had not looked at investing at all, got an opportunity to talk about investing or learn about investing directly from the horse's mouth. So that I think, and luckily after that, the market also did phenomenally well. So once you taste, taste success, then you don't want to go back, right? So that is what happened. So there are a uh, confluence of three, four factors. Uh, the, the brokers, the new age brokers who were very, very, very active on social media. Uh, the COVID thing where we all are confined at home, we don't have anything to do. So why not check, check this out? 
and then the market also did well so everything right. fell into place which led yeah. to this yeah makes sense actually yeah yeah uh, so uh, like now smart sync is education plus advisory as well uh, so do you think for a retail investor the natural evolution is they first trying to learn and understand how things work then eventually take support of some research or advice services to complement their their own research and then eventually move to something like a fund like a pms or something do you think uh, this is the right evolution to go for a retail investor and what role does capital has to play in each of this evolution in your understanding sure so see i i personally feel that i don't know about other markets but indian consumer is very peculiar so first of all a, an average indian consumer doesn't want to pay so i'll give you an example uh, nothing against any particular profession but i'm just giving yeah. you an example for clarity see if i be a mutual fund distributor and right. a general mutual fund distributor and i say as, assume that you are a uh, a retail investor Okay, right. you have you have just started uh, earning well, say well, and you want to invest in mutual fund. If I tell you that okay, as a mutual fund distributor, I'll manage your, I'll give you good advice, and I'll give you some really good index funds, one or two index yeah. funds where your future is secured. You right. will happily give money to me, as in uh, go by my advice because I'm not charging you anything. I'm making money through the back door where I get right. back right. from the right. mutual fund holders. But if I tell you that I am a semi-registered fee-only advisor, I will yeah. charge you a very small fee and you will save on the uh, the high cost you pay to go through a mutual fund because the expense ratio is higher when you go for that. Yeah. They don't understand these things. And it is very difficult to make it understand for a retail public who has not even looked at investing as a whole. So yeah. that is why this whole system is unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, is made in such a way where if you don't charge them uh, upfront, they mm -hmm. will tend to go with you uh, much more than you charging them. Even if mm -hmm. the charge is very uh, minimal. So that is one aspect. Plus, when you talk about different products like advisory, education, even though I make most of the money by... Uh, talking about direct equities and investing in direct equity, I have very uh, I have a good clarity that for majority or maybe ninety percent of non-investing media uh, person people who are not into market, for them yeah. investing in direct equity is not mandatory at all. I think what is more required is you do well in what you are doing, be it your business or your job, save well, and. It Take a take an exposure in equity. That equity can be through mutual fund or that can be through stocks. But to start, I think mutual fund is a very, very, very good tool. Even though I personally don't invest in mutual fund, I recommend a lot of investors to start, a lot of people to start. In fact, many of my friends and many of my family members have now started investing in mutual fund. Starting with my wife, five, six years back, I forced her to start a mutual fund investment. So even though I being a Hardcore equity guy, I always say that direct equity my investing karna is not a mandatory thing. We are most of the public is way better off just investing in mutual funds. Okay, so uh, in that and sense, PMS PMS is, yeah. PMS is something very 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 far fetched. You 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 think about PMS only when you have a sizable purpose. Mm -hmm. PMS should be looked as a completely different asset class there are a good there are a bunch of good pms managers whom you would like to give your money so that you get higher returns but first you need to grow yourself to that stage before you look at pms is what my advice to maximum people would be yeah that is what i was trying to ask like for someone to evolve to a fund uh, i think the right part would be first to understand and educate like how things work and then move to Exactly. own research and then probably to a fund so in that sense uh whom according to you would be someone who should look at direct investing say someone who has like half of the day free and they can invest that time frame or you know what according to you would be someone who can do it like who should do it like 90 percent of the people that you say should ideally 
do their own business and uh, then uh, use mutual funds as a uh, tool. But for someone who is interested, what according to your some of the pre checks that should be there for them to you know try and venture into direct equities. Yeah. So whatever comment I made, I am I made for people who are not interested in investing. Okay. If you are invest interested in investing or learning about investing, I don't think any job is a barrier. I I know of many 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 smart investors. Many of them are my friends only. Who are who have never been full time? In fact, one of yeah. our uh, guests on our podcast, Mr. Abhishek Basu Malik, I have high yeah. regards for him. He came into full time investing in two thousand eighteen, and he yeah, has been investing intense. since two thousand. Yeah. Okay. So this is a myth that you have to be full time investor. Some of the smartest investors I know are not full time, and they have made huge money, huge wealth in terms of CAGR. Uh, oh, yeah. while staying in a different job which is not related to investing at all so one thing which we must first need to understand is are you interested or not if you are interested we will find out time when we can find out time for netflix and yeah. uh, friends and other parties we can definitely find out time for uh, learning a skill which we are very passionate about that is what i so i learned more uh, when i was uh, setting up my business, I used to st st read more. I used to spend more time then because I, yeah. I wanted to learn this art. Yeah. So nowadays, I spend more time in my business and administrative uh, work rather than research. And I miss those early days where I used to spend more time on research. So right. it is always like that. If you want to know, or if you want to learn, you will learn. Yeah. But it is not mandatory for everyone to learn. If you're not interested, yeah. it's yeah. fine. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, so, big question now, uh, Ankit ji. What, according to you, are some of the key challenges or some of the three, four key mistakes that retail investors typically make uh, in investing and how should they look to address them? So, I'll, I'll give you my own example. So, when I joined, I worked as a equity research analyst for one year. I was just observing people around me. All of them were either two year, three year, five year experience in the market. And even though they were research analysts, I saw that most of their stocks were just bought on tips. Either their senior has told or a broker has told or kahi se cover mili, or some yeah. or thing like that. So I personally made a very important rule for myself in 2009 when I started that for the first one, one and a half years, come what way, I will not invest in the market. I didn't know much about Charlie Munger at that time. I didn't know about that quote where all I want to know where I'm going to die so that I will not go there. So when I read that quote later in my life while reading about Charlie, I could relate to it because I never bought on tips even from day one. So the biggest or let's go one step back. How do most people come into investing? They come into investing by watching or by hearing about a friend or a, or a relative who has made it, made big in the market. Yeah. And there is a high probability he or she would have made big by uh, doing something in f &O or in three yeah. months, one stock would have become a 10x or an 8x. Yeah. So your starting itself is a flawed start where you are looking yeah. at one uh, isolated example and thinking that it can be replicated consistently. Yeah. So that is the biggest thing. So that is why I keep, whenever a prospect comes to me, I first want to, uh, I ask this question, you want to be financially free or you want to be uh, a very good investor? If you want to be a very good investor, then look at direct equity. But if you just want to be financially free, you can do it through mutual fund investment. You don't have to look at, you have to spend time because you are already working in a good job and your skill sets lie somewhere else. Why take time out? Only if you have interest and if you if your uh, dream is to become a better investor, then you should look at equities. Right. So most people start equity with these kind of tips. And I'm not talking about people like uh, people who have just come out of college or just joined job. Yeah. I, have, I, I can't reveal the names and uh, their uh, personality, but, but I have come across lawyers, doctors who have really good wealth and they have lost crores of rupees uh, just by these FNO tips and going for greed. So yeah. greed and fear, what we call 
so that is the biggest problem i think fear comes much later first greed. problem is greed when you join the market because of greed that is the biggest problem and i don't think there is any solution to that some people uh, so one good thing nowadays is that there is a lot of content available on the internet so if you start say for example if i am a completely new newcomer if i want to uh, know how to do investing if i type that on youtube or google there is a high chance that i get some really good content and i can go through that and i learn but say if 3 4 years back 4 years uh, 5 years back nothing was there so most people have those kind of uh, bad start where your start itself is a very flawed yeah yeah no well, that's a very interesting point i think the if the start itself is from a mistake then it becomes very difficult to then you know correct it yeah. like because the mentality can can't be changed unless you end up say losing either substantially or you know something clicks you know ye nahi karna hai right uh, another thing uh, that a lot of retail investors make is re over reliance on say near to performance so they switch mutual fund uh, depending on who has done well and who has not done well in the recent past they switch advisors right they'll put money or withdraw money from the market based on what the recent performance has been which is typically opposite of what it should be done typically if someone has gone through a bad cycle then typically it's uh, probably a time when the good cycle for them will start uh, based on your experience uh, do you think this continues to be a issue and you know you can share you can share some experience wherein you know people have done this and made huge blunders out of it yeah yeah so i again so ankush this is very relevant point uh, so most of my customers or uh, prospects who i meet i again give them the example of uh, real estate investment because any everyone has one relative in the family or a friend who made good in real estate investment yeah so i ask them this question why do you think that guy forget about the cagr probably that cagr yeah. would be much lesser than the cagr you can make an equity but try to understand why that person made good money in real estate investment one and the only reason is that that person didn't have a daily price uh, to check and a daily market to buy and sell you cannot exchange on a daily basis and you cannot see the price on a daily basis so that is the problem with uh, investors where because there is a market where you can daily check the price and daily exchange your asset you think that uh, you should be more active i am not against active investing per se mm. that's a different uh, discussion altogether but what i am trying to say is that the reason for people not being able to hold on to their investments even mutual fund investment is the daily availability of information so uh, I, again i'll give you a relevant example uh, one of my colleague in that uh, uh, company where i worked for in a year so i yeah. asked that if you found a good company you you invested in it why you sell, uh, sold in two two weeks or, uh, only so he said that i am hooked to screen and the screen is screaming at me that i have to sell this stock it doesn't have power so so again yeah. when you have that kind of a so your habits so your habits take precedence like uh, there is that say, uh, famous saying uh, i'm forgetting the name of the author where he says that you don't rise to the level of your goals you fall to the level of your systems yeah. or habits right yeah. yeah so so that is what happens if you are not in the right habits if you keep on checking so i don't have any money control or any app or any kind of app which will give me my portfolio uh, okay. this thing i have not even made an excel sheet or google sheet where i keep updating my only way to look at my portfolio performance is to log in to my uh, brokerage account check and then i would know yeah. that makes that is a habit which which is a deliberate habit by which i don't look at my portfolio performance on a regular basis second right. i have not looked at i have not watched cnbc since 2014 so 2014 i completely block the channel of cnbc and it again nothing against yeah. these channels uh, they are reputed business channel but i think that it lead to bad behavior from an investor's perspective right and when you are in a media industry you are uh, you have all the interest in 
accentuating what is there, be it good or bad, right? Be it positive or negative. So these are the habits which we want must inculcate if you want to be uh, a long term investor. Right. Uh, based on what we have discussed recently, I think the fundamental problem lies in the behavioral aspects of it, right? I think if, and that is where I think content still lacks. I think now also the most of the content is around how to do it. Uh, whereas I think there's still a lack of, you know, knowledge or content on why it should be done and, you know, the whole thought process behind it. Because Based on what we have discussed, I think the eventual problem lies because of your own behavior, right? I mean, whatever mistakes that you have discussed about behavior eventually. Uh, another thing, Ankitji, that is now uh, being propounded a lot is about index investing, right? A lot of, I mean, globally, it has become one of the phenomena that invest in index fund, index fund. Like, I personally believe that uh, even if we can take some effort to find some good mutual fund or whatever, if you can add like three, four percent of additional alpha over the index, which is not a big ass, it's like a mid teens kind of returns. Uh, so, do you think uh, that index fund is a way to go in the long run, or do you still think that active investing has a role and that is where people should go? Either through a mutual fund or their own investing? See, I. Yeah. Yeah, you were saying something, Ankush. Yeah, I was saying that uh, active investing either through mutual funds or through their own uh, self-investing. Sure. See, there is space for both. I would say there is space for both, very clearly. Uh, I find it very disturbing or illogical when people say that only active investing will win in the long run or there should be only uh, index investing. One thing I am very confident about and very strongly uh, view is that for majority of people, index investing does a fantastic job. There is no two way about it. It does a very fantastic job. It doesn't mean that you should not go beyond it. Okay. If you are happy with the kind of returns you are making through index fund and uh, it serves your investment goals, you don't need to look. You, everyone should not be looking beyond it. Like as they say, right? Uh, personal finance is more personal than finance. If you're happy with a 12 to 15% annualized return, you don't actually need, because if you go outside your circle of competence, may there is a high chance that you may for, uh, you may not even get 12 to 15% return, which you were uh, earlier uh, trying to get. But that doesn't mean that there is no space for active funds. There are, there are people, there are fund managers, there are good quality PMS managers and uh, uh, the mutual fund managers or individual investors who do a lot of hard work, who get a lot of insights and they are actually beating the market consistently. Now, do you want to become an investor like them or do you want to uh, be, a, uh, be it like a sidecar investment where you part with these kind of people, uh, park your money with them? Yes, you can do it, but there is a risk to it. Like, we all know that at the start of the fund, you don't know how the fund will perform. And as the firm fund performs over the, see, you need at least one cycle to play out, to judge up right. for funds performing. But the, then comes a new problem with those funds, is that the size of the fund grows. Okay. When the fund size grows from something like, say, less than 1,000 crore to about, say, 50,000 crore, in a matter of two, three years, five years of very good performance. You can't expect the same kind of outperformance by that fund, right? Plus there is another risk is the fund manager risk. What if that the fund manager go, uh, goes away? What if that fund closes down? So these are the risk which is real, but these are opportunities also if you can find the right uh, fund manager or if you can hone your skill and be a good investor, you can beat the market. But if you look for the base rate, if you look back and see, you will see that invariably index fund has a advantage over direct investing. So my advice will be always be go with the direct investing only when you have trust in the fund manager or you have trust in your own ability where you think that you can be a better investor going forward. So one exercise which I ask everyone to do is 
for the first five years of your investing, split your money into half. Put half of the money in index fund and half okay. of the money you try to learn about investing yourself or give it to uh, a few fund managers and see how it works. So when I say few fund managers, I'm talking about mutual fund. Say you have a yeah. small set yeah. of money, a small set of money, so you can invest in mutual funds. So. And in the five year period, if those uh, returns are some sort of, say for example, if you get 12 to 15% return in uh, index fund, at least you should get 10 to 12% or 15% return in your direct investing also. Or even if you are getting say 9% or 10% return, in those five years, you should get some confidence that you will be able to improve these returns going forward. Then it makes sense for you to go for direct investing. Otherwise, direct investing is of no use for you. But saying that direct investing is dead is again a very wrong statement. Direct investing is pretty much alive and it will be alive 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, probably 100 years from now as well. Yeah. I hope I could answer the question. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, what, what I, interesting thing I could understand is uh, index investing actually takes away some of the behavioral risk and issues that we just discussed. Like if you're in, investing through in, index, you're not no longer looking at, you know, how the XYZ fund has done and trying to switch countries consistently with this one, this one, this one. Yeah, that actually is a very good insight that, you know, with index fund that behavioral issues to a large extent gets reduced. And that way, I think and for a lot of Ankush, people, it would be a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah, Ankush, one more point. So we think that most of us really want to uh, be a good investor or uh, to, to learn about investing or to be, to improve our CAGR. Majority of us actually are people belonging to a herd or a club. We want to be in the club. We want to yeah. show off that, yeah, we belong to that tribe. We belong to this yeah. tribe. Uh, these guys are uh, making good money. I am also joining them. So I am also part of that. Because of that, all the problems happen. We don't look within. We always look out. Like as Buffett says, we don't have an inner scorecard. We have an outer scorecard. Outer scorecard. And that yeah. is where all the problems begin. No, I, I think that's interesting. I think another thing that keeps uh, getting someone to keep, you know, even after they have been proven wrong by the market or they have realized, you know, they are not good at it. Like, uh, at least on the trainings, I have seen this a lot that, you know, even after losing a substantial amount of capital, uh, people still keep going. I think because there is a hope that, you know, eventually you can beat the market. And that hope exactly. keeps you going until you have reached a point where you, you no, no longer have the uh, capital or the capability to lose more and that right. hope part i mean a lot of people say that you need to be optimist and need to have that hope but uh that can also work against a lot of people uh failing like uh failing them to recognize that you know this is not something that works for me like i can't do it which is why i so mean that is people, in that yeah yeah so that is not investing or trading. It is yeah. playing gambling. Yeah. You're thinking ki mera lottery lag jayega. So you're waiting for that lottery to hit. Right? Yeah. You're not actually doing any professional trading or investing. Right. right. Uh, now, uh, you know, Ankit ji, given that you interact with so many retail investors, uh, how do you see complacency or fraud build up for retail investors over the last couple of years? I mean, last couple of years, the market has been wherein uh, most of the people have not seen a big time correction. I mean, the biggest mantra now is buy the dip, right? So, uh, in your understanding, how has that complacency built up? And in the future, as in when we see that, you know, impending time, long time correction, how do you see that impact some of these investors who have not seen that uh, in the past? Sure. I don't know whether I'm qualified enough to speak on this topic, but uh, I'll still share my views. So, first of all, what is fraud? I don't know. I I find it very difficult or uh, it's a very heavy word to use, fraud. And I'll tell you why. So, like, if you see, let's compare the market scenario, what we are in today, to say something like 2003 to 2007 rally, when the yeah. market rallied. So, just to give you some data, small cap, rallied 10x 
in that period. Yeah. Okay, 10x and then fell 75% in the next one year or two years. Okay. Yeah. Then again reached its peak in the next two years, okay. the previous peak. Okay. But then it took eight, nine years to go past yeah. that peak. It's yeah. 2017. Okay. Yeah. So this is the nature of small cap index. To a certain extent, in is in the small cap and micro cap, and when you go further down in say that is where yeah. some level of froth is there. But in general, what my understanding of the market is, I think this market is kind of this bull market is far more broad based than any of the past bull market we had seen. The reason being the kind of liquidity we have from domestic investor and also the kind of availability of different industries and different companies. Right. So if we compare 2003 to uh, 2007 period, there were only doing well, real estate construction and all. Yeah. But this time, what you are seeing is that there is a very good sector rotation happening. Sometimes railway is doing well, sometimes defense is doing well, sometimes IT is doing well, now banks, then sometimes some other industry. So this is a healthy sign of a bull market. This, this kind of market is a very but coming back to your point, where you say that some of the retail investors who have just joined after COVID, they have not seen any prolonged corrections. So my understanding is that the market is the biggest teacher uh, and everybody learn in their own way. So times are always different in a way that uh, the kind of uh, experience people had in the last 10 years and the kind of experience people will have in the next 10 years would be completely different. Even though we keep on saying that markets are same, there will be bull phase and then there will be bear phase. But uh, you also need to understand where we are in terms of the journey of our economy. right? So if you ask me today, I, I don't believe in predicting or anything. Of course, market will correct. There can be crashes also. But India as an economy today is a far more... Uh, robust economy and the demography is far more in our favor. Plus, if you compare ourselves with economies, we are in a very, very, very good fitting, uh, footing. Now, and we, for the first time in our history, we are not uh, dependent on foreign funds or domestic funds itself. The problem with all these things is that everything is working for us. So I will now introduce what Taleb has been famously saying in his books and also in his several other, other communication is that it's just like that Russian Rolling, which has a million chambers. And uh, because you tried, uh, tried it a few times and the uh, bullet never came out, you have actually forgotten that there is a bullet which will yeah. eventually come out. We just don't know when it will come out. right? So that is the big risk which all the investors, uh, new investors and old investors also, it's not just the new investors who will have this problem. There are many old investors also who are also uh, so drunk in the rally yeah. that they will yeah. also probably forget about their old lessons. right? Yeah. Yeah. So that risk is there for sure. But my hunch is many of these retail investors a good section, I should not say many, a good section of this research, retail investor is also becoming smart. So they are well, very well educated about investing. They have attended a few courses, genuine courses. I'm not talking about the courses yeah. where uh, you do all yeah. sort of uh, <laughs> different things. So, and uh, and look at people like uh, SOIC. Uh, Ishmoid has done a fantastic job there uh, to educate and look at some of the uh, YouTube channels of some brokerages where they also give some really sane advice of how to invest in mutual fund, how to look at different industries. So this retail public is definitely far more educated and trained than the previous one. But there is something which you learn only from experience. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there is no better experience than a bear market. So when it yeah. will come, they will also learn. And maybe I will also learn again. I don't know. I don't want to say that I will not learn something new. But I 
I am I am of a person I am a person who will not look for crash or not get uh, not get uh, too cautious about it or try to predict when the crash will come. Rather than that, I think even after four years of very good rally, I would still say that there are opportunities in the market. Of course, it's not easy Absolutely. to find, but if yeah. you work hard, there are still in the broader market. I'm talking beyond the Nifty 50 or Nifty 100 or Nifty 200 stocks. If you really do the hard work, because the market is very wide. It is not just uh, confined to the first 100 or 200 stocks. So, Arjun, let's talk about investing now. So, how do you invest as an investor and say on the smart things side, what's the framework of say, the advisory part of what you do? Sure. So, uh, so I wear two hats. One is of a investor, my, my personal investing and the other is of an advisor where I have yeah. a certain products and services. So, I first talk about myself. I was always an impatient person. So I used to do a lot of mistakes by not waiting for things to happen and then repenting on that. So that mistake of mine, in hindsight, worked for me when I joined market. So when I joined market, I already had done so many mistakes by being impatient. That patience came very naturally to me. When I, I didn't realize it, but I, I saw that patience came. So that is how I modeled my investing where I will look at businesses where the quality of the business should be good. I should be able to, and I'm not just uh, giving you a gyan of quality of the business. I'll just explain to you what is quality for yeah. me. Invariably, um, almost 100% of the stocks only two, three, four players. Okay. Either in the listed space or in the overall space. There, yeah. are, there are only two, three, four players. That gives me confidence that it's an industry where the profit pool is concentrated on a few players and you can right. take a far longer, uh, you can you can bet on it on a longer term because the yeah. competitive dyna uh, dynamics will not change, hopefully. Yeah. Of course, yeah. there could be some yeah. changes going forward. But looking at the current scenario, yeah. so again, not taking any stock names, but yeah. so like cash management industry, yeah. it is becoming consolidating over the last 10 years and it will further consolidate going forward because uh, biggers are become, big, big players are becoming bigger. The regulators are making sure that stringent conditions both in terms of your uh, net worth and also in terms of your processes uh, are put. So smaller players will find it very difficult to survive. So this is an industry where I can take a longer term view. I don't know exactly what a company will produce its earning, say, five years, seven years, ten years down the line. But mm -hmm. as a from a industry point of view, I can take a longer term. Right. Mm -hmm. So now with this kind of example, I put the three basic rules which I follow in investing is that number one is don't predict, prepare. Mm -hmm. I will never predict about a company's uh so I never do an elaborate DCF. I will have a DCF frame of mind, but I will never do an elaborate DCF that this company will have uh, this much cash flows or earnings three years, five years, seven years down the line. I never do that. Second, uh, do few things, do them well. So I have a very small set of industries where I understand things, but I try to do very well in those. So if I am okay. investing in a company, I probably, and when I say very well, it doesn't mean that I should know everything about the company. Yeah. What I mean by very well is that what are the key four levers of the business which will eventually decide the long-term uh, path of the business and also the long-term share price movement is what I try to focus on. Right. So, second one I just said is know few things and know them well. Yeah. And the last one is Consistency is more important than intensity. I don't want to time the market. I don't want to uh, say that, okay, this is COVID time, market has crashed, I'll go all in now. 
neither would i would say that okay market has done really well over the last four years i'll take cash out now sit on 40 50 percent cash and wait for the crash i am not going to do that i believe that there is far too money being lost by waiting for a crash for opportunities and i would try to invest regularly so every month i have a fixed uh, routine first day of the month first trading day of the month i invest in a 20 stock portfolio okay equally all, all stocks, long -term irrespective stories. of price and everything i started this portfolio just post covid okay. in august 2020 all these are long term stories and i am since i am doing sip investment in these stocks there is a very clear cut of which industries will not form yeah. part of this portfolio. Yeah. I don't have any of the high flying uh, industries. Like I don't have any defense stock, yeah. no railway, uh, no PSU, no metals, no commodities, uh, no construction, no real estate, none of the economy facing direct stocks, yeah. right? Or industries. Yeah. And that is how I invest where I don't want to focus too much on the share price movement on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. I am by, by going by this. So li like talking about uh, habits again, by forming this habit on a day to day basis, my mind is always looking for new ideas going. So I am more of a research analyst than an investor. I keep on researching on new ideas. I keep on listening to my team members who work harder than me and come up with new ideas every week or every month. Whether we invest in them or not, that's a different matter. But they keep working on new ideas all the time. I listen to a lot of smart friends regularly, but I don't do investing actively in that way. Okay. So this is in nutshell how I approach investing. Okay. Well, that that was actually very interesting. I think the overall of approach of you know uh, limiting to certain industries. Uh, which are consolidating and within then doing a 20 stock SIP portfolio. I mean, that's very interesting and very peaceful, actually. Like, uh, I mean, it's, it's peaceful. That's, that's yeah. the right word. It's peaceful. It may not be very, very high CAGR, but yeah, yeah. it has worked reasonably well for me and I am happy with that. So yeah. no, actually it makes it a lot of sense. Actually makes a lot of sense because honestly, I mean, the biggest problem with long-term returns is not being peaceful. I mean, when you try to start, you know, two things out of your comfort zone in trying to catch that return. But I think the approach that you're following eventually in the long run, that could be the best outcome that one could have. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask over here is, uh, since you're looking for this industries that are consolidating, uh, to a large extent, you're also betting on the industry itself, right? Uh, that the growth that the industry will do and the dynamics of industry either improving or staying stable. So. Uh, is it that you're betting on a single player which you think will become the eventual winner? Or in some cases, you're also betting on a couple of names in that industry to you know try to diversify like a basket approach and capture the eventual return that the industry will end up delivering? Sure. So first of all, I'm not betting on only industries which are consolidating. I'm betting on businesses where or industry where there are very few players. It did not be yeah. consolidating. It's a, yeah. Maybe it's a new industry, it will open up new players also, that is also fine. But main thing is that the, the profit pool is with three or four that or max five players. Yeah. So you, yeah. it gives you a very good uh, visibility. I'm not, uh, so predictability is a wrong word. You can have a better sense of where the business would be say five years, seven years, 10 years down the line. Right. Uh, keeping aside the numbers. But, so what I, I forgot your question question what did you ask no so in certain industry do you uh, have a basket approach where you buy a couple of players not just one so i'll give you i'll give you example there so since i have exited the stock right now i can speak openly and i'll again run the disclaimer this this is not a recommendation to buy or sell so there is a luggage industry is a very a very common industry and everybody knows about mm -hmm. the, the two large companies which are listed mm -hmm. in this space. And I happened to invest in uh, VIP industry. It was part of my original 20 stock SIP portfolio. 
Okay. Now, that experience and that mistake taught me a lot. I I am invested in VIP even before COVID. And when I look at when I look at when I look back and see into what I did in 2019, the only reason I didn't hold uh, Safari and I bet I bet on uh, VIP was that when I reached out to the management of Safari, I didn't get any answer. And they never used to hold any concurrence. Yeah. And even in their annual reports, they used to give very, very, very little information. Yeah. Whereas VIP was very more open. So that created right. a bias. That here is a company which is being much more forthcoming and sharing everything. And then there is a company which is very, 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 uh, this thing, uh, yeah. reserved and not sharing to the minority share. And it created a bias, and I and I kept on looking at VIP only uh, as a investment option. And post COVID, you would be aware that there have been several uh, changes in the top yeah. management. There, yeah. there have been four MDs, if I'm not wrong, four, four yeah. or five MDs in the last four years. Four, and now the CFO becoming MD. It's five. Exactly, exactly. Recently, the CFO, I think 2023 August is when the yeah. CFO was. Uh, uh, yeah. Promoted to the MD. Promoted to, yeah. So, yeah. so, I put, so when I look back, in fact, last week only I wrote a blog on this, where okay. when I look back on, at the whole journey, uh, I realized that because I was not giving too much attention to uh, Safari because of that one bias, I missed yeah. out on a 10 bag. Yeah. And even though you pick the right industry, there yeah. is a you are prone to not Maybe. selecting the right winner. Yeah. Right. So that mistake uh, led me to evolve in a way that in the CMS industry, when I started buying shares there, so there I invested in two companies. I didn't okay. bet on only one. Yeah. Because yeah. I this is this was my learning from my whole journey of that luggage industry. Yeah. Maybe. I have liking for this A company, but who knows in the long run, the B becomes better. Yeah, and yeah. collectively, I am sure that this industry should do well. So I should have both A and B and see how it goes. And when I yeah. have A and B both in my portfolio, there is a higher probability that I uh, pay more attention to both the companies. Yeah. So that is the logic why now I don't look at just and. Anyways, I was never looking at the eventual winner. I was always looking yeah. for good investment opportunity. Like you, right. you, you take an example of the paint industry. Everybody yeah. talks about Asian paints all the time. But look at right. the performance of burger paints over the last yeah. 10 15 yeah. years. Yeah, absolutely. So that was my learning and that is what I changed last year only. To incorporate right. more players from the industry. If you like the dynamics of both the players. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, Agiji, is this portfolio available for SmartSync uh, uh, clients? Yeah. Is that the core offering? I share of the advisory? It the advisor, uh, yeah, it is, it is available. I share it with my advisory clients. Okay. Uh, there are both retail and HNI clients who are following this stock SIP uh, portfolio. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. that's the core offering, or there is another offering, like a different strategy that you offer there? This is the core offering of okay. our uh, fund management where we okay. I invest my money in this way and I offer this to my clients okay. as well. There is no right. difference there. But we also have a stock advisory offering. Okay. Okay. Which is focused only on small cap and micro cap stocks where we don't okay. give any recommendations from a portfolio perspective. As in, we don't give you portfolio allocation and we don't give you exact portfolio, but we yeah. share our research. Research. And we give a buy sell recommendation. Okay. And our universe is very small. In the micro cap space, we focus on stocks which are less than thousand crore. In the micro, in the small cap, we have five hundred crore to three thousand crore market cap range. Okay. So we don't go beyond that. And I have personally never invested in the micro cap space. So we have uh, collaborated with uh, Mr. Atul Rawal, I know him since okay. last five, seven years. And he has been investing in the micro cash space for last 30 years. He's based out of Eldawar. Okay. So okay. it's a different person running uh, that framework. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
the final question that I wanted to ask Ankitji is that uh, given that uh, you run smart things services uh, over the years, like with my personal experience as well, I've seen that if you're offering some education or say advising service to public at large, uh, the feedback loop is uh, exponential in terms of, you know, the pace of learnings and the quantum of learnings. So what are some of the key, uh, you know, impact that, you know, running uh, SmartSync has brought to you as an investor? So, see, first of all, uh, I completely uh, believe that I am blessed in a way that the kind of people I have interacted with. So, the first person's name which comes to my mind is uh, Professor Sanjay Bakshi. So, when I was starting up, uh, Vishal Khandelwal's blog was definitely the first step to learn about investing but then soon you need more more depth more understanding yeah. more guidance and only thing which i had at that time was professor sanjay bakshi's uh, wonderful blog and you won't believe i i wrote mail to him uh, a few times and then he responded to my emails we chatted over the phone he helped me in so many ways since 2014 okay so and when I started this Mission Smile uh, uh, educational platform, yeah. Professor Sanjay Bakshi was the first guest I invited on the podcast. So through okay. Professor Sanjay Bakshi's, uh, so I requested him and he uh, he agreed to do it. And because of that, I got connected to so many big investors in the market. Through them. So I don't want to talk about so many opportunities which came out, but the thing is that, as you rightly said, see, internet is a very, very, very powerful tool. And if you can show your work online to an audience, yes. it can have a ripple effect which you which you can't even imagine when you start up. Yeah. Right. So right. there have been so many connections, so many good investors I met. So some of my close friends today, I met them through uh, Safal Niveshak's uh, website. And they from them, I learned the most today in investing. So I should thank Vishal Kandelwal and Safal Niveshak for that. Uh, Professor Sanjay Bakshi personally introduced me to some of the very bright students of his who are already doing very good in the investing phase, uh, investing space. They helped me a lot in shaping up my investing philosophy in the early days. So all these, and then I'm not even talking about business opportunities. Yeah, so Business yeah. opportunities have also come up really after. So before COVID, we didn't know that small, there, there is something called social media and you have to be active there and it can open up opportunities. Only after COVID, we started becoming active here. And we are actually uh, uh, seeing the fruits of being active on social media as well. Of course, it has its uh, yeah, downside okay. also. If yeah. you end up spending too much time on social media, it uh, deviates you from your main focus, but it definitely helps you in your business. So okay. I am very, very, very thankful to all the people, not just my close friends and uh, teachers and uh, investors, but also the whole community uh, of investors who are either following us on Twitter or watching our YouTube videos or are part of our Mission Smile community platform. Okay. Oh, that was great, Ankiti. I think uh, a lot of really insights, I think that would help retail investors and also uh, people who are looking to solve for retail investors. Uh, at the end of each of the podcast, uh, what we do is we want a takeaway uh, for the listener in form of a stock recommendation typically. Uh, but in your case, uh, what I want is like cash management is an industry that is looking good to you. Uh, can you talk about another industry within your 20 stock portfolio that you think uh, is looking good from your perspective and why? Like you don't have to take names, but a general understanding of why this industry is good. Sure. So uh, I don't have, uh, I can, I'm fine with taking name also. That is not a problem. So, uh, but just don't take it as a recommendation. It is not a stock recommendation. So there is one company in my portfolio, uh, which was a very simple investment. And I'll be very honest when I bought it, uh, when I, when it entered my portfolio, I didn't know that there will be so many new themes, which will include this stock as well. And the name of the stock is Blue Star. 
it's a very simple company yeah. where uh, the only reason to buy that stock was that uh, i knew that in my portfolio i can't take exposure to uh, directly capital goods player or uh, construction player or real estate but i know that probably uh, indian economy will do well and these guys will uh, do well blue star was a company where uh, i could see that they are not present only on the room ac but also on the uh, commercial ac plus so many other projects where their cooling system is used and i'm talking about august 2020 you can go back and check the valuation at that time point of time yeah so yeah. the stock was available very cheap and uh, and uh, i could see again the long runway there are you can argue that there are so many other ac players in the market but the kind of business model blue star has a, a very close cousin is uh, voltas but you don't have too many other players uh, yeah. in the same uh, space so that is the only company which i can talk about right now so there are no so when i bought this was the thing the ac penetration was so low even today yeah. the ac penetration is so uh, so little and one thing which we don't understand which we, we we should understand uh, which came as an insight to me at that time when i bought i was in ahmedabad right now i am in bangalore i was in ahmedabad you won't believe in my house we first bought one ac then two ac mm. then three ac and then we ended up having four acs in our house right. so that itself gave me an insight that this market is so small and it how big it can become like if you have a yeah. washing machine you can only have one washing machine you don't need a two yeah. washing machine in your home yeah. so that is how you should uh, look at two different companies in a completely different way how much an ac business can scale up or how big the opportunity can be of course there are a lot of competition and yeah. there is not much difference between a voltas ac or a blue star ac or so many other players but if you look at the commentary from the management on the con call or on the annual reports you'll see that this is one business where the management uh, walks a tight rope between market share and margins so they yeah. have their eyes on both the things which i think is a very important thing for them right no the the point But of the again, penetration is interesting this is yeah. a portfolio stock i am invested in it yeah. uh, please don't take me as a recommendation yeah, i am a sebi registered investment advisor so a disclosure yeah. yeah the point i was making is uh, the point that you made around 1 2 3 and 4 ac i think that is interesting because in a household as soon as you have that one penetration of ac that actually grows non linear to 3 4 as well where in in other consumer durable category you don't have that scale up that happens it is exactly okay great uh, thank you ankit sir again for doing this i think uh, there's a lot of good learnings uh, thank you everyone for listening